Good morning, everyone. My name is Raghurao Sodabatina. I'm an enterprise solution architect based out of Boston. I've been with AWS almost two and a half years. With me, my colleague, he will introduce himself. Yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Chang Bing Gong. I'm a principal uh, solution architect with AWS. So I have been helping customer building data lakes for over the years. So really glad to, to be here you know, today with sharing some experience. And uh, so today's talk is a chalk talk, right? So we want to maintain the, the session to be more interactive as much as we can, right? It's the first session in the morning. And uh, so hopefully everyone have enough coffee and uh, ask us any question you may have. OK, let's get started, right? The objective of uh, today's session is to understand how to build modern data lakes on AWS by using lake formation, Amazon Redshift, and AWS Glue. As we mentioned, right, it is a chat talk. We want audience to be more interactive. Please stop us, ask questions, right? So let's talk about uh, high level agenda for today's discussion. We'll first talk about trends in the data lakes and analytics, and then we'll talk about how to build modern data lakes on AWS. We'll also discuss about modern data lake reference architecture in AWS. That reference architecture can be used across many industries, across many use cases. And then at the end, right, we will take an example use case and then dive into that example use case. And we will try to build an architecture based on the business requirements. OK, let's dive into the trends in the data lakes. If you look at right, data volumes are increasing. They are exploding from terabytes to petabytes. Sometimes you see like exabytes of data. And we can also see there are new types of data, like structured data, unstructured data, and there are streaming data as well. So if you look at right, traditional on-premise analytic approaches, they can't handle these volumes because they don't scale well enough and they are too expensive. And also many customers, right, they want to build a, better customer experiences by using real-time data, right? What, uh, what it mean real-time data, what it mean like uh, real-time experiences, right? Let's take an example. Uh, you are running in a retail website, right, today, right? Let's say a customer is uh, placing an order, right? And you wanted to see those orders. Let's take a two example. One example is like uh, you are getting like 100 orders in a, within a minute, right? You are getting 100 orders. They are really good orders. That is good for you, right? Because you're getting more business, right? But you wanted to make sure that you are able to fulfill that order, right? So as and when that is happening, right? You wanted to notify your warehouse saying that, hey, check this order is coming. Do we have the enough quantities? If not, try to prepare those quantities, right? To serve the customer. Another example could be like, maybe somebody trying to hack your website by placing some fake orders, right? And you wanted to notify your security team, right? To make sure that uh, uh, the, Actually, to make sure that there is something is happening, right? So that you can you can notify your operation team, right? Another example is uh, some of the customers are coming to your website, and you wanted to show personalized recommendation, right? To to build more customer experiences, right? That is where customers really wanted to play with the real time data. Now let's talk about uh, data lake. Anybody want to talk about what is data lake? Anybody? <laughs> Sure, go ahead. <laughs> One person? <laughs> OK. Yeah. So let's talk about what is data lake, right? So data lake make it easier to gain insight from all of your data, right? By providing a single place to access all of your data, right? It could be a structured data, or it could be an unstructured data, right? What customers are looking? They are looking for a high scalable, available, secure, and flexible data store, right? That can handle extremely large data set at reasonable cost, right? That is where the value comes into the play, right? What is the data lake, right? Because you could be having like a mini application, right? You have a data in applications, right? Uh, and then you could be having a data in databases. You wanted to bring all this data in a central location so that you can unlock the value of your data. So let's talk about, uh, we are talking about structured data, unstructured data. Anybody want to take a guess on what kind of data formats? So the standard for data format is like CSV. CSV data format is basically good for a very small data set, and it is like a row level, right? If you are dealing with a large data set or a complex kind of a workloads, like big data processing, 
row level might not good fit for there. That is where you use the column level data where you can do the compression, right? That is where for key will come into play. And most of the applications, right? They are very familiar with the JSON kind of a data where you can store it, it's kind of a schema, it is very flexible. You can pull the data from the JSON base and then ingest into your database. So let us talk about, right? We have been talking about what is modern uh, uh, data lake. Let's talk about it, right? So as we discussed it, right? If you really wanted to bring all of your data and then you wanted to really build a better customer experiences, you wanted to derive the insight from your data, on-premise data, right? You have to deal with a lot of compute and storage because they both are coupled each other, right? That's the reason as a first step, what you are suggesting here, move your data into the cloud. That is the first step in our journey, right? And then we really wanted to make sure that you, you, uh, you wanted to have a right tool for the right job. That is where purposeful data lake architectures will come into play, right? We'll, uh, I will talk about what are those purposeful analytic architectures, right? And then the next one is when you have a data lake, right? You want to make sure that you have a data warehouse also, right? You wanted to modernize the data. So why you need a data warehouse, right? Uh, let's see, you, uh, you have some historical data where you wanted to build an aggregation, right? Where you want to derive the insight and, uh, and do the, some core, uh, basically forecasting, right? That is where you need it. So the modern data lake is combination of your data lake and then data warehouse. And then once you have the data, right? Then you build a data-driven application. As I, uh, as I talked about in earlier example, right? The data-driven application could be like uh, giving a recommendation to your customers, right? Or alerting a security person if there is something is happening. And then other thing is like AIML, right? Once you have data in a data lake, you can use the machine learning to, to provide a recommendations, right? Uh, there are many ways you can do the recommendation. You can use the Amazon SageMaker or you can use the AI services, which we'll talk about it. So let's talk about like uh, what are the typical steps uh, involved in a data lake, right? The first step is you need to have a storage, right? You need to make sure that you have storage in place when you started building your data lake. Second step is you need to have a basically data ingestion, right? You need to ingest your uh, data into your data lake. Based on your data sources, we are going to look at it like uh, what kind of tools you have to ingest the data, right? The next one is, yeah, you're getting a data. What is the next step? Next up, we are going to catalog the data. You need to have like a schema for your data and the metadata, right? That is where uh, you will maintain all your uh, uh, data there, right? And then once you have a data, we have a catalog, maybe you'll not be able to use the data because as I said, right, you wanted to analyze all of your data, right? Data could be coming from multiple sources. That is where data processing will come into play, right? You might clean the data, you might enrich the data, right? That is where data processing happen. And we'll talk about what are the tools we are going to use to do all these steps, right? And the next one is now you have all the data, right? You wanted to make sure that you have a security and governance in place, right? Because you wanted to make sure that you have a fine-grained access controls out there, right? You don't want like a data lake, data is available for all of your employees, right? There could be a multiple personas, right? Maybe one persona wanted to see only one set of data, right? That is where we are going to talk about lake formation, how you can basically provide fine-grained access control by using the lake formation. And the next one is, once you have all the data security and governance in place, you need to identify your personas, right? Where uh, you provide the analytics, right? That is where there could be multiple personas, they can start using the data. Sure. Uh, see, sometimes, right, let's take an example, right? Uh, you are running a machine learning, you want to do the data prediction, right? Maybe you wanted to see how your raw data looks like. That is the reason you do the cataloging. And then you do both, right? Uh, before cleaning, after cleaning. Yeah, this is a good slide. Uh, this is a standard uh, data lake. Uh, whenever you are planning to build a data lake, these are the steps we need to follow. So I'll stop here for a minute for any questions. As I said, we wanted to make sure it is more interactive. And then we'll talk about each step, right? How you are going to accomplish each of these steps by using different AWS services. Yes, lake formation will come, in, will come into security. Uh, 
Yes. You can use the AWS uh, Glue Data Catalog for that. We'll, we are, we'll be talking about AWS Glue as well. Any more questions here? Okay, let's talk about it, right? Uh, these are the small examples. Maybe data engineer is really interested in cleaning the data, processing the data. Data security person, they wanted to make sure that you provide a fine-grained access and control. You don't want to open whole wall, right? Because you are bringing data from all the sources. You wanted to make sure that you provide the right data for the right persona. And then once data is there, data analyst, it could be a data analyst, it could be a data scientist, it could be even business users. So let's talk about now, right? We understand now what is modern uh, data lake and how to build modern data lake. Now let us dive into how we are going to build modern data lakes on AWS. As we talked about, right? First step is you need to, you need to have your storage. Unlike uh, on-premise data centers where storage and compute is coupled, right? If you wanted to scale, you need to think about what kind of data I need to keep in my data lake, right? That is where Amazon S3 will come into play here, right? Uh, if you look at it, we'll talk about Amazon S3 a uh, little later, another slide, but let's talk about what is happening, right? Uh, in earlier days, right, what is a data lake? We already, if you look at like uh, 20 years ago, we started with like a database, right? And then after a database, what is the next set? It's called data mart, right? You create a data mart, it could be a department or it could be a division kind of a thing, right? Where you create a data marts within the database. And then slowly, we moved from data mart to data warehouse, right? Uh, if you look at the screen, right? Here you have ERP, CR, CRM, like LOB based, right? Business unit based and all. And it's kind of a, all data silos, right? That is where we are talking about modern data architecture on AWS. So what is modern data architecture on AWS? As we talked about in the uh, middle, right? Storage, Amazon S3 is your storage, right? Where you can bring all of your data into your storage layer, and then you have Amazon Athena. Athena is an interactive query where you can query the data by using SQL query, like a standard SQL query. And then you have a lake formation in between, which will provide you the, um, basically, data lake administration where you can provide fine-grained access control. And then AWS Glue, that is where your data processing will happen. You can bring the data, and then you can clean the data, you can enrich the data. And then if you look at it, right, when we talked about modern data architecture or modern data lake, right, we wanted to make sure that we have a right tool for the right job. We don't want to use the same database. Let's look at the 20 years ago. We have a database. I started my career with Oracle Developer, right? I wrote a lot of code, PLSQL, and I also developed some reports and also did some uh, uh, reports, visualization and all, right? Every time we go, we use the same database. And then we create some, something called data mod. Data mod is nothing but, we wrote, uh, I wrote some triggers and store procedures, right? To put the data for uh, data mods, right? So we really wanted to decouple everything, right? That way you can scale independently. If you look at here, some of the services, right? If you are looking for a data warehouse, we have an Amazon Redshift, right? It's a modern cloud data warehouse. You don't need to worry about uh, managing your uh, hardware, software, right? And then we have, Amazon Kinesis and Amazon MSK, if you wanted to deal with the real-time data, you can use the Kinesis and MSK to bring the data into your data lake. And then Amazon SageMaker, we are talking about uh, how to do the innovation with your data, right? Data protection is also very important, right? In order to engage your customers and you wanted to build new revenue streams, you wanted to make sure that what customers are looking at it, right? That is where you can unlock your, unlock your data value by using Amazon SageMaker. And then DynamoDB, sometimes imagine, right, uh, earlier when we started it, we are using like a SQL database, right, or a relational database. That is the only the way we are doing. But now technology is evolving and we are trying to do the purposeful databases, right? Any given application, we are using relational database, non-relational database. Sometimes you want to bring that uh, metadata or non-relational database into the data lake. That is where you will use the Amazon DynamoDB here. Amazon EMR, as we know, right, big data processing. Imagine if you wanted to build a, a big data platform on on-premise. You have to do the hardware, and then you have to install the software, and then again, you have to bring each of the software. That is where AWS is providing Amazon EMR. You can just choose the platform what you want. It could be a Hadoop, or it could be Hive, or it could be Presto. Just do the check marks. It will launch the cluster for you, so that you can use the big data processing. You can do the ELT, you can use the Spark, um, and also you can use the Spark ML as well. 
if you are if you are very familiar with that then you can use it and then amazon aurora amazon aurora is sql database right where you can bring in your postgre sql database mysql database and then amazon open science if you really want to unlock operational analytics or you want to do the log analytics that is where amazon open science comes into play and how this is all going to work we will be dive into one use case example use case where we will be talking about this any questions on here and we'll also talk about architectural uh, design choices when you are when you are taking example what to use when right yeah sorry yeah yeah yes right yeah glue has a basically connectors built in connectors right let's assume like you don't have a connector you can also build the custom connector how you are going to build the custom connector you can use the standard jdbc odbc right your data should be could be anywhere it can connect to the your on premise data center as well as long as you have a network connectivity between the on premise and aws okay so let's talk about uh, next one right the important is storage this is very very important i think right this is where cloud modern data lake is coming into play here right we wanted to make sure that you decouple your compute and storage and amazon s3 is the most popular storage for data lakes and it provide you to the best uh, best security compliance and audit capabilities when we talked about the lake formation right the lake formation is tightly coupled with amazon s3 where you can basically provide the fine grained access control let us take a step back here what is mean fine grained access control uh, so the way we recommend customer when you are trying to build a data governance and aws we want uh, customers to use iam for coarse grain access control what do you mean coarse grain access control let's talk about coarse grain access control let's say you are bringing a data into data lake you have a lot of data sets right so who has the access right whether that person has access to your whole uh, whole data lake uh, you wanted to make sure that they will have access to s3 bucket right s3 bucket is nothing but your storage layer so once they have the access to that right you want to go further down right you wanted to give the access at the table level at the column level at the row level that is called fine grained access control that is where lake formation will come into play like the way in a traditional databases you give the grant access right grant select or insert like that you can simplify your uh, whole data lake uh, governance by using the lake formation so let's talk about uh, uh, important thing right this is the whole uh, data lake architecture let's talk about data movement right we talked about it right first you need to set up your storage that is amazon s3 amazon s3 is serverless now you already identified your storage layer now you need to bring the data into your data lake that is where you have aws database migration service what is uh, aws database migration service let's assume that uh, you are storing a data in a database you want to bring the data into data lake that is where you use the dms database migration service and then snowball and so mobile let's say you have a large amount of data in our on premise where you wanted to basically bring the data into a aws right that is where you use the snowball but if you have like a very large amount of data that is snowmobile right you can the, there is going to be a truck and then you can copy it's like petabytes of data you can bring and snowmobile is basically you can go to aws management console just request it and then they will ship you the device and then you store the data and send it back it's a, you can completely track end to end when it is reaching aws data center when your data is available right and then kinesis data firehose and kinesis data stream whenever you are dealing with your real time data real time data could be devices or it could be coming from your application that is where you are going to use the kinesis data firehose and kinesis data stream and uh, msk msk is like uh, nothing but uh, apache kafka apache kafka is a very popular open source for uh, for dealing with the streaming data based on the many customer request we started providing that as a managed service so we'll talk about when to use kinesis data firehose kinesis data stream as compared to msk when you deep dive into a use case right and the last one is we talked about uh, lake formation blueprint lake formation blueprint is nothing but behind the scene it is a glue jobs you can use the jdbc odbc driver you can bring the data from your on prem data sources 
or it could be from AWS data sources. What is AWS data sources? It could be your database, RDS database or Aurora databases. And then once you have uh, data out there, right? You have a Redshift data. Maybe uh, you have a subset of data where you wanted to do the forecasting, right? Historical analysis, where you want to do the aggregation. That is where your uh, data warehouse come into play. That is where Amazon Redshift is there. And we talked about most of these services, right? Amazon EMR is for big data processing. Athena is for interactive query. And operational analytics, Amazon Open Search. What it means, operational analytics? Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, right? If you really wanted to see what is happening in the near, near real time with your application, as soon as the data application is placing an order, right? For, for example, going back to the e-commerce, right? Let's say a customer is coming and he's placing an order, right? Then um, what you can do, you can basically collect the data through the log and then analyze whether order is fake or it is going to be some fraud uh, kind of order. And then you can create a, a dashboard kind of a thing. We call it as a Kibana dashboard, where you can set up the alerts as well. So we'll go to the use case, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. And then data exchange is like, there are popular uh, data providers, right? Where they're uh, basically producing the data into AWS data exchange. You don't need to build any transformation to bring the data. You just connect to the AWS data exchange to pull that data. For example, it could be a Bloomberg data, right? And then visualization, Amazon QuickSeed is a uh, serverless where you can create a business intelligence report. And then we talked about the real-time recommendation. So Amazon Personalize, as I said, uh, let's say your customer is looking for something, you wanted to really provide the personal recommendation, that is where we use the Amazon Personalize. And then SageMaker, SageMaker comes with a lot of built-in algorithms, right? And you can use them, or if you wanted to bring in your own, uh, your own algorithm, you can do that as well. Any questions on this? Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's because of space. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, sorry to backtrack a little bit. Um, yeah. The fine grain access control for S3. What's yeah. the actual avenue for that in uh, leap formation? Is it IAM policies or bucket policies or? Yeah, I, it uh, behind the scene it works through the uh, IAM policy. Like, let's take example, right? Before lake formation, right? What we do, like, uh, if you wanted to provide a access control, right, to a table or a column, basically you will go to IAM policy and then you will put the table and all those access, right? So that is where we are providing a, a easy to the customer so that you can use the AWS lake formation. So, so just one adding that, so lake formation itself, right, the services, and uh, so it's on top of that, depending on your granular, how you want to do, you know, the table level, row level, column level. So that's the opinion of that policy. And then they commission working with your catalog, right? So that's the way they can be enforced by, by that granular kind of permission control. Yeah. 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 yeah, yes. So the question is, and if I already have a data lake, right? Is, is that the case, lake formation will apply? The answer is yes. The lake formation works is, you know, you, you, you have your data, uh, existing data lakes where using glue probably generates your metadata, right? The lake formation is actually from the metadata perspective to control your, your access to the data in your data lake. So that's it works. Yeah. yeah, what you can do, right? Let's say you have IAM policies where you would have provided like a table level, column level access. It's kind of a two-step process. Uh, we have a guidance. I can share you the blog where uh, you remove those uh, table level, column level access and then... Uh, provide those uh, table level, column level access by using lake formation. Yeah, so yeah. there's a question back. Yeah. So yeah. back, you know, on, on, on lake formation, when we're applying users here, uh, or access to the users, is that how that is? IAM users, is there SAML integration? What, can you talk a little bit about the users we're applying into lake formation? In yeah, formation? Uh, see, you can do both, right? Both means uh, you can provide to an IAM user, all right? or maybe depending upon your use case, if you have like a group, right? And then uh, it can connect to SAML, right? Uh, it can connect to your uh, external identity provider, like uh, Okta, Auth0, or Ping Identity, or even uh, Microsoft uh, Active Directory. And then you tie back that to a role in the IAM, right? And then based on the role, you can uh, provide the lake formation, fine-grained access controls. And sometimes you might need a, uh, maybe you don't have a group or a role, then you can provide IAM user, right? Maybe you have a one kind of a persona where that person is really wanted to have like a mix of access, 
then you might end up using a uh, IM user, map that to your uh, external identity provider. Okay, so let's talk about a uh, little bit more, right? If you look at this slide, right, any of the services which we talked about it, be it a Glue and uh, EMR, Redshift, we just launched uh, serverless and uh, they are in preview pretty much within a month or two, you are going to see them. If any of your customers uh, or your organization wanted to try it, there is a preview version for both of them, Amazon Redshift and Amazon EMR. You can try it out and see how it works. And the rest of the services, if you see, right, um, Amazon Kinesis and then Amazon MSK and uh, QuickSight, all are uh, uh, basically serverless. But uh, MSK uh, is going to be a serverless. So when we do the serverless, the idea is you will have both options. You wanted to have a, like a managed services and you wanted to have a serverless. That is going to be applied for uh, Redshift as well as uh, MSK. So now let's see like uh, the other slide. These are the customers who are building uh, data lakes on uh, AWS. So we talked about a uh, couple of things, right? We talked about uh, what is modern data lake, right? Why we care about modern data lake. And we talked about very high level fundamental, how to build a modern uh, data lake on uh, AWS. Now we talked about uh, how to do it. Now what we'll do, we'll deep dive into three services. AWS Glue, Lake Formation, and the Redshift. As we said, right, when you're trying to build a storage, right, uh, your storage is a combination of data lake and uh, data warehouse, right? It's not only just like a data lake. You want to take uh, advantage of both, right? That way you can uh, really derive more insight from your data. So now um, my colleague will cover about uh, these uh, three services in detail, and then um, we will talk about the next. Sure. So thanks, Rago. So I was, you know, so far we have been understanding, you know, what's the modern data lakes is about. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, before we proceed, I, yeah. I want to come from my understanding. Um, sure. So real time analytics through MSK, does yep. it sit before the data lake or does it sit after data lake? So is that the processing can be both, right? Depending on, you know, you can be in the ingestion stage. Once data is loading into the data lake itself, we can have additional post-processing, right? So in this case, both plays can be played. And we see, you know, for example, MSK can be in the pre-processing stage when you have the data and using MSK to ingest that data into the data lakes. So even uh, data lake formation can feed the data into the real-time real analytics? Yes. Yeah, so, as a post-processing? Post yeah, yeah, so for the post-processing, mostly focus on the glue, but for example, we will talk about later in the slides, for both glue and the lake formation, have, they have blueprints. Mm -hmm. They're able to have some beauty in the glue jobs. It's able to bring in the data in a batch of you know, streaming fashion to be loaded into the uh, data lake itself. Okay, thank yeah, you. Sure. Yeah, so I just want to, as Rogu mentioned, we, there's many of the AWS analytics services in there, right? So one calling out the three kind of fundamental services is the key, right? Glue, lake formation, and the redshift itself. So as you can see, there's different stages, right, when you're building the data lakes, like ingestion, security, and the uh, analytics. So each of the services is going to play into the different stages, right, like glue, mostly in the help in ingesting data, you know, to the data lake itself, and also help to do the transformation, right? We, we do the extract, transform, and the loading, right, the old ETL firms. That's one of the primary function of the glue itself. And the security we have already touched upon, lake formation, we'll delve into a little more details. And obviously on the analytic side, we will talk about the Redshift and the other different services. And here we're just gonna focus on the Redshift. So just that will be, you know, a lot of folks probably already know what about Glue is about, right? Just wanna highlight, Glue itself is providing a service, you know, we call it data integration service, right? So the service in nature itself, the Glue makes this very easy to consume. And uh, you are actually focused on how to build your ETL jobs rather than how to scale the cluster underneath. So that's one of the things. As Raghu, you know, just pointed out, we have many of other services kind of hop on this service of battle wagon, right? Because this benefit providing by the customer, because customer in this space can really focus on the business application, business values rather than the underlying infrastructure, right? So, so that's one of the key benefits of using Glue itself. And obviously other capability providing by Glue is like data cataloging, right? Essentially it's a metadata store, right? Some of you folks have the big data background, you probably 
here the uh, the hive metadata store in the past. So glue itself will be generated that catalog is kind of compatible to the hive uh, metadata stores. And uh, so another part is, you know, the folks may be wondering about when they lock in. So the good thing here, glue itself is building on top of the open source Spark framework, right? And uh, all the Spark, you know, open source Spark scope, high Spark, and the Scala. And that's all you can, you know, you've written the code in that you can directly import into Glue that can be built in that Glue job itself. So it's not locking in. So some of the job you're building for Glue, you can mig migrate out for your, you know, it's probably other open source based Scala and the, uh, and the you know, PySpark jobs. So that's the one of the things, you know, is, uh, is no wonder locking from that perspective. So some of the use cases we probably already touched upon, right? Definitely when you're building a data lake and uh, Glue can help that services. And the other services you know, Glue can provide is, for example, you have want to do a, a machine learning. One of the, the you know, we said is 80% probably the job when you're doing machine learning is training data, clean the data, right? So, but here, Glue itself providing a lot of services like Glue Data Brew, right? And some of the capabilities really help you very easily to clean the data, make sure the data is ready to consume by the machine learning. So this is some set of the service itself. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. So, the key difference between Glue and EMR, when to use it? Okay. Yeah. yeah the question is, uh, key difference between EMR and Glue, when to use it, right? This is the question. It's a good question. Uh, so EMR, with EMR, you get a Spark, as well as uh, other big data processing platforms, like a Hive and uh, Spa and Presto and all, right? If you are dealing with uh, uh, basically Spark, uh, we would recommend you to use uh, uh, Glue because it's a serverless. Also, um, uh, basically, uh, it provides a lot of other things. We talked about uh, uh, lake formation blueprints, right? Uh, because you can bring the data. For example, if you wanted to uh, basically process large volumes of data, then even with the Spark, we recommend you to use the EMR, right? And the other uh, use cases, let's say you wanted to basically uh, modify uh, Spark configuration, custom, that you can't do with the glue because it's a serverless. That is where you go and use the EMR. The basic guidelines is if you're dealing with a, a small data set to medium data set, use the glue. And if you're dealing with the large data set, you can use the EMR. And uh, maybe two months down the line, you will have EMR serverless also. Then you can pick and choose which one to use, right? If you are, let's take an example of your use case where you want to do both, right? It could be a Hadoop as well as it could be a Spark, all right? Those kind of a use cases, it is better to use EMR than Glue because Glue supports only Spark. Is that answer your question? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so there's a question in the back. Um, does Glue provide any kind of data lineage uh, capabilities? Yes, uh, we have like a Glue data brew. Uh, it provides like a data lineage right where you can see what is happening but it is not like an entire life cycle of a, a, a whole data pipeline uh, but we have new services coming up i can't uh, disclose now but uh, we are working on it to provide end-to-end -end, uh, data lineage but if you are trying to do uh, bringing a um, your raw data and then we are trying to transform if you want to see the data lineage uh, glue data brew can provide and also you can it comes with uh, basically some of the recipes where you can basically use them to transform the data and then you can see the data and based on that you can just do the drag and drop. Yeah, great. So, uh, so is there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is Glue a drag and drop tool? Low code, no code or? Uh... Yeah, so I can address that. So as you can see in this slide in here, right? So Glue the capability I can break down into connect, right? And uh, you know, the uh, cleaning and transform, right? Cache catalog perspective, right? So Glue does have that tool. We call it Glue Studio, and it's a low code. And you know, some of the folks are not a diehard ETL developers, right? PySpark. So that's why you can using that Glue Studio using drag job to automatically generate the, the Glue job itself. So, so you have yeah. a flexibility, right? It comes with if you look at there, right? Uh, you have transform, right? You have a Glue Studio. Glue Studio is like a low code, no code, just drag and drop and uh, it will generate the code for you, right, for your transformation. Another one is Glue Dev Endpoints. If you are, if you are familiar with uh, basically uh, notebooks, right, that is where you can use the Glue Dev Endpoints, right? 
the third one is glue data brew where you wanted to see the data lineage that is where uh, it comes with some of the recipes where you can do the data transformation as well yeah so i just want before some folks ask a question about the glue connectors right so in this case it's depending on your different data sources and uh, glue is up providing some built-in connectors and uh, but if you're not able to find it from the built-in out of box connectors you will have the way to building your own you know kind of connectors just like if you have jdbc sources and other sources can can build that for you so once you have the connection right you can using the group have another critical crawler so how you building the catalog so it's it's kind of automatic automatically crawling the data to finding the schema and generate a data catalog so this is the, uh, some of the uh, built-in, you know, kind of out-of-box connectors. If you're not finding the, you know, some of the names in here, and obviously you can build your own. So let's quickly jump into the lake formation. And uh, we have you know, a lot of questions around this here. So the main focus of lake formation it definitely is focused on the centralized security and the government control. But one of the you know, initial when we're building the lake formation is actually have another capability we call lake formation blueprint. So really help to you building the lake you know, very short period of time. So it's kind of pre-built and the glue jobs, right, really help you to migrate data from whatever the sources, typically the, you know, the relational database sources and to that migrate that data and transform ingest into the data lake itself. So that's really help you to work seamlessly to, to kind of ingest data and starting the data lake. So lake formation itself, right, it's just kind of expose some of the, it's based on the, uh, the glue itself, right? Some of the capabilities building on top of glue. And other on top of that, I mentioned the blueprints and some of the security and uh, you know, search and collaboration purpose, right? So the security itself, we are mentioning the fine green access control can be controlled you know, from different levels. So it's, you know, even I building uh, the uh, day lake for many years, I had to admit it's, it's not easy, right? How to building a modern and secure day lakes. So you can see the three kind of different pillars, right? How you can, you, when you have data ingest into the data lake itself, your data ha constantly have to be updated, right? In some cases, it have to be deleted. How you can prevent, you know, accident delete, how you can give different users different kind of access permissions. So that's the, in the middle part, right? It's the main kind of function providing by the uh, lake uh, formation itself. And uh, so good part is, uh, you know, I'm chatting with some of the folks here, lake formation has many of the native integrations with many of our, you know, service itself, right? We mentioned the uh, glue and itself and Athena, some other you know, services itself can be uh, natively integrated with the lake forms itself. So that can be able to access, it pose a control policies to the service you can access through the services itself. So another thing I just want to quickly touch upon is uh, Redshift. So as you know, Redshift today is actually, we, we first launched uh, uh, Redshift is about 2013, right? Almost a decade at this point. So a lot of new features, you know, kind of really into the Redshift. So why we build this uh, Redshift in the first place, right? It's because some of the on-prem data warehousing solutions are not able to scale and are costly, right? That's the two kind of fundamental things we're gonna address with the Redshift itself. So adding on some of the new, uh, new uh, re renovation we have for the Redshift itself, we can see many of the features in here, right? Like the Redshift spectrum, right? So in this case, the data actually can reside on your data, uh, the data lake itself, and uh, without moving the data into Redshift, you are able to have the joint query to access and the data to providing that you know, kind of complex joints and the query itself. So in this case, is you, you can run your additional BI in the applications itself. Um, Rago mentioned the serverless, right? Serverless definitely is a trend. At AWS self, we are also try to uh, support as many of the serverless capability for the service itself. So, Last uh, December, we in our reinvent, we announced the Redshift serverless. So highly recommend everyone to, to try it out right now is the, uh, still on the public review, right? In this case, it's when you configure the uh, Redshift clusters, you don't need to have to, you know, to worry about how to configure a cluster, how to launch a cluster. So this one automatically kind of configure that for you. So this one is the, uh, re depend on different regions. So since it's in the public review and uh, it's not, you know, all the regions support it. So I, I think given the time, and I want to jump into one of the good topics, you know, we talk to many of the customers and uh, they have very similar needs, right? In some cases, how to migrate data lake from the on-prem to the cloud environment and the different data sources and how to use it. That's why we're building this uh, reference architecture. And uh, 
So the framework we want to use, is really recommend around thinking is you break down into different layers, right? You can, depending on your user personas and uh, depending on your different data sources, and also from consuming end, right? Who are the consumers? Is this for the machine learning workload? Is this the data engineering? And uh, so with that in mind, you can very easily, based on different layers, you can pick choose the right services for your right use cases, right? And that we'll be using a one uh, example use cases kind of walk through each of the layers and uh, to illustrate you know, which of the services are best uh, for different user cases itself. So this is the, kind of probably the money slide, right? And uh, you, you can take pictures or you can Google it, it's public. And uh, if you just, you know, you know, title modern data analytic reference architecture, itself is kind of based on the each layers in the previous slide we're calling out and which the service is in there, right? The, 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 the point in here is not you using every single service here, right? It really depends on your different data sources, is it structured, is it batch or streaming? So you can pick choose the right services um, and kind of for your right use cases. So in the next, I think we'll yeah. be... So, but the yeah. better interest of mm -hmm. time, right? Let us take a example use case. Uh, we'll dive into the architecture, right? Yeah. Uh, also, I wanted to make sure that uh, it is more interactive. Um, and also, we are going to talk about different design choices, right? What we are using and all. So let's take an example, right? Uh, let's assume that uh, you have application data, right? That data stored in our uh, MySQL database. It could be anything, just an uh, example, right? And then you have orders data, because I was talking about orders data, right? Uh, it could be coming from Shopify, right? Just to make it simple, right? And then maybe you have like a customer support application data is in your gen desk, right? That might be stored in a JSON format. And then third party data, right? See, now social media is very popular, right? Let's say you have your company website and you are selling some product, right? It could be anything, right? Insurance or anything, right? You wanted to see the sentiment, how it is happening, and you wanted to basically understand how you are doing, and then you try to build a better customer experiences, right? Based on the feedback, what you get it. Uh, that is another thing. Another thing, device data. You wanted to get, uh, it could be a mobile device, it could be iPhone or Android phone. You wanted to basically get the data and see uh, how you can derive the data, right? And then data consumers. Here there are only three data consumers we are talking. Basically business analysis, uh, they are not familiar with the technology, but they just wanted to build a business intelligence report where they can quickly drag and drop so that they can see the forecasting and then how it works, right? And the data engineer, they really wanted to do the data cleaning, right? And data transformation or data processing, whatever we call it. They wanted to make it like more uh, data uh, enriched, right? So that it can be used for different personas within our organization. And the data scientist, I mean, they really wanted to build an innovation, right? By using the data, whatever your enriched data, they wanted to basically, uh, they want to build the machine learning, right? So that you can predict the data to improve the customer experiences. Yeah. So just one point out of here, just you know, if, uh, the, the, the persona, right, only three in there. And uh, just you know, for this sample use cases, there's many other personas, right? So you can plug in and things. So let's dive in here, right? Uh, let's, uh, let's take an example here. Uh, first one, right? You want to build a data from application data, right? Application data is basically uh, stored in your uh, uh, database, right? So here you can use the DMS and then uh, you can load into the your landing, right? So we'll talk about the storage layer. Before that, right, we will talk about the data ingestion. So here the suggested architecture is uh, DMS and uh, the requirement what we are talking about, right? You wanted to basically uh, do the change data capture. It could be uh, every one hour, right? So for that use case, uh, it is always uh, recommended to use the DMS because uh, you wanted to get the data and then you also want to do the change data capture. Now, you want to talk about alternate approach, we talked about lake formation blueprint. Why can't we use the lake formation blueprint, right? You can use lake formation blueprint and there is incremental also you can do it, but if you are looking for a change data capture, whenever the data is happening and you wanted to build a uh, near real time kind of a experience, that is where you use the DMS as compared to lake formation uh, uh, blueprints. Right, and now let's talk about the second use case, right? We talk about you have Facebook data, you have software data, how you do it, right? So here, the one way job is like, uh, you can write a Lambda function and then pull the orders from the Facebook or Shopify and then uh, load into the uh, S3 bucket. 
and uh, there could be other ways right where you can basically uh, use the um, api base right api base means like uh, uh, you write a lambda function let's take an example you wanted to get a data every day from the facebook or maybe software right then what you can do you can use the event engine it's kind of a scheduler right every day uh, you just uh, ask a lambda function to go and pull the data and load it into your data lake. That is also one option. Or if you wanted to use the glue jobs, you can also do that. And also you can build the, we talked about, right? Chengman mm -hmm. talked about the custom connector. You can also create a custom connector to build the data. Which one you wanted to use it? It is based on uh, your uh, familiarity, which is, use, uh, which is good for you, right? You wanted to make sure that uh, that supports. Now, Gendesk, right? Gendesk is like a customer support where we have an app flow. You just need to basically, it does everything for you, right? You can basically connect it to your SaaS application and you can uh, load the data into your landing zone. Can I use different uh, uh, services, right? Yes, I mean, you can always use the JDBC, ODBC by using GlueJob, you can bring it. But you don't need to do it here because we have native integration with uh, many SaaS providers, including Salesforce, ServiceNow, by using Appflow, right? You don't need to write all those uh, glue jobs and all. You can just uh, mention your uh, source location and then uh, you can bring the data. And then now bringing the streaming data, right? Here's the thing, I think somebody was asking question. When to use Kinesis data streams, Kinesis Firehose as well as uh, MSK. Let us talk about uh, first uh, Kinesis, right? Uh, the Kinesis uh, data stream, if you are looking for like a real time data, right? you wanted to basically stream real time, that is where you can use the Kinesis data stream. And if you are looking for a near real time, what you mean near real time? Let's say if you have like a one minute delay, you are fine with one minute delay, then use Kinesis Firehose. And we recommend Kinesis Firehose for near real time data because it's a data delivery kind of a service. You can, Kinesis Firehose can deliver the data into S3 bucket. It can also deliver your data into Amazon Redshift. It can also deliver data into Amazon OpenSearch if you are trying to do the operational analytics, right? Or it can even deliver the data into Splunk, right? Or it, you, uh, it can deliver data into like a custom HTTP endpoint as well, right? Let's now go back to the Kinesis data streams, right? Let's say you wanted to bring in real-time data, right? Kinesis data stream cannot deliver data anywhere. Again, you have to use Kinesis Firehose to connect with the Kinesis data streams to deliver the data into different destination. That's the reason if you are uh, okay with the near real-time data, that is where you use the Kinesis uh, Firehose instead of Kinesis data stream. Now let's talk about uh, MSK. Apache Kafka is a very, very popular uh, uh, streaming technology. Many of our customers are using. But uh, if you wanted to really manage Apache cluster, hardware, software, it is you have to do the heavy lifting, right? You have to manage the, sorry, go ahead. When, um, do you see a situation, I see a lot of glue jobs obviously, but what situation would you use the Kinesis data firehose built-in transformations that they offer, like JSON to Parquet, for example? Yeah, so when you are bringing the data right through Kinesis firehose, you can have a Lambda function in between to do the transformation, your own transformation. For example, let's say you have a log file, right? Uh, maybe it could be a web server log file. Uh, let's say you want to deliver those log files to Amazon OpenSearch, right? Amazon OpenSearch uh, expert JSON format, right? So you can use the Lambda to transform the data. So small, small, simple transformation, you can just use the Lambda in between with the Kinesis Firehose, right? You don't want to use the glue, right? You want it to, it all depends, depends on your use case, right? And we talked about the glue. Here we mentioned about the glue, but again, if you are looking for a big data, uh, large data sets, or a big data platform where you want to bring the data by using Hive or Presto and all, then use for uh, uh, EMR instead of the glue. Yeah, so I just want to add in for that. Right? So the, the other benefit using the Fairhost is also, Fairhost kind of natively supporting the destination, right? Not only the F3, you can pipe the data into the other, like, you know, Redshift. So in this case, if you write your own glue job, right? And obviously you can do the transformation itself, but then you also have to, to see, okay, what's the destination you have? So that's a lot of overhead in that sense. But again, using glue gives you a lot of more customized way to control, right? It's depending on the use cases to see what's, you know, you want to have more customized control in the more destinations, right? Because Fairhose only supporting a limited kind of destination right now. And so that's another kind of category you can 
pick choose which one you want to use. Yeah, going back to MSK, right? Uh, if you are very familiar with Apache Kafka and uh, you wanted to bring a, a large data stream data, like uh, 10 MB of data, uh, then you use the uh, MSK because Kinesis supports only uh, 1 MB. 1 MB means like, let's say you are sending the streaming data, it can uh, add up everything up to uh, up to 1 MB. Whereas MSK, you can add up, your data can be add up to 10 MB as well. And also if you are looking for uh, more uh, uh, latency, right? Less than 70 milliseconds, that is where you use MSK. Many customers are using uh, MSK today and MSK is also have native integration with many services. And once uh, you have data, right? Uh, we always recommend that you bring a raw data and then do the transform by using the either glue or EMR. And then you have a transform data, whether we call it as a curated or enriched. And then you can also do another transformation to enrich your data. That is where your storage layer is. If you look at it here, it is a combination of uh, Redshift and uh, uh, your data lake here, basically. And then uh, analytics here, right? You have a Athena here, and then you have a quick site. So let's talk about Athena here, right? Athena is basically ad hoc queries. Again, there are many options here. When to use Athena as compared to EMR. EMR comes with Presto or Hive, right? Um, basically, you can also you run the interactive queries by using either Presto or Hive, when to use it. If your data sets are very large, and then uh, you wanted to basically, let's say maybe more than five, uh, five terabytes or maybe 10 terabytes, then it is better to use uh, your EMR cluster with uh, Presto or Hive. If you are familiar with a uh, Hive kind of a thing, then you go, you can do and do that one, right? Because if you are trying to do like a very complex kind of a aggregation and all, Athena might not be the right choice for you. But Athena still provides the value because if you wanted to basically uh, query the ad hoc data, how the data looks like, the Athena is going to help you there. And then um, other thing, Redshift, right? If you really have a historical data and you want to do the aggregation, run a, some kind of a complex ETL, that is where you use the Redshift there, right? Because you can also do the interactive query by using the Redshift, right? And if you are trying to uh, combine the data of uh, Redshift and uh, data lake, then uh, basically Redshift uh, spectrum will come into play, right? How, uh, what is the use case, right? Because it's, let's say if you have historical data, you keep all the historical data into your data lake. And then maybe last 12 months data, or six months data, depending on your case, put the data into Redshift cluster. And then you query by using Redshift uh, spectrum, data from data lake, and as well as data warehouse. And then you have a uh, basically fixed site, right? Fixed has a native integration with uh, Athena as well as the Redshift. Let's say if we have a, some data sets in the Redshift, you wanted to create a dashboard by using that. You can just basically use the Fixed to, uh, to build the business intelligence report. And then once data is there, it's all like a sales maker. Yeah, so I just want to add one more. Here you can see we purposely break down the, the you know, kind of day lake industry, different bucket, right? You can see the raw or landing and the curated. We see many customers doing that. You know, why we recommend this way? This is a couple of things. So one is you, when, once you have landing data, you have maintained this raw data in a raw form, right? So there's a lot of signals in there, right? Depending on your current use cases, you transform, you put in a curate, make it ready for whatever the downstream. But in the end, maybe you have another new kind of analytic services, you still maybe come on go back to your raw kind of landing bucket. So in this case, you, you still have maintaining some of the raw signals in there. So that's the one way we recommend. The second thing you see here is, of course, have sandbox, right? Once you have a curated data, why you know, I still need a, a sandbox? In some cases, you putting your as a production workload right into this curated, and you have the downstream analytics. But you have your developer want to sample of the data. You want to train some new models and things in that nature. You don't want to interrupt with your production you know, bucket in there. So that's one of the reasons we put in there as sandbox, right? In this case. You can free give your developers, you do whatever you want, right? In this case, you, you don't need to worry about interfere with your production, you know, the, like, data set in there. So that's one of the ways in here. So again, this is just a proposed architecture. It's not a setting in stone, right? You can adjust it based on your own needs. And uh, so, so that's the, the key point of, you know, you ch I think it's choose the right services for your right use cases. It's not, you know, you, you always a trade-off, right? Using Glue or using Lambda using EMR or Glue, using lake formation, maybe other services, right? Using Redshift or using others. So the thing is, key thing in here is you have to examine who is your user personas? What's your downstream analytic consumption needs? 
And what's your data sources, right? Based on that, it can say, okay, that's just my, you know, the choice for you see all the services to use. Yeah, go ahead. Quick question on the Kafka. Do you yep. have any comparison between Confluent, Kafka, and MSK? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, I want to repeat the question. Yeah, right? so yeah. I'll repeat the question, right? Uh, uh, there's a question about uh, 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 Confluent, Kafka versus MSK, right? Uh, we just, uh, me and Changmin, we just published a white paper called uh, Build uh, Modern Streaming uh, Architectures on AWS. Uh, there, we talked about uh, exactly what you are asking, right? Uh, when to use MSK versus Kinesis, when, uh, what is the difference between the uh, Confluent Kafka versus MSK? To answer your question, most of the uh, uh, popular features already there in M uh, MSK but there are some of the PHS, right? Uh, the way we catch up is like, it takes like two months uh, because Apache Kafka is an open source, right? I mean, anybody can contribute and they keep on innovating, right? As and when new innovations are coming, it takes like two, three months to get into the MSK because MSK is a main services. We wanted to make sure that uh, we tested in all the regions before it comes. Yeah. And if you have a particular uh, uh, feature which is not supported today, please reach out to your account manager, solution architect. Uh, we can talk to you about uh, when it is coming. Yeah. And I would all, all, always recommend, I'll, I have a slide where uh, you can look at that white paper because we wanted to address uh, the yeah. customers uh, what to use uh, when and all. Yeah. So, so this, the, uh, you know, it's just to learn more. Right? This is some of the, the kind of white paper and myself and uh, Rugu kind of work on. So back to your question, right? So MSK as a native AWS services definitely have much more better integration with other AWS services itself, right? So providing a benefit, you don't need to make another connector to connect to another service itself. So, so that's an, another you know, added benefit of using MSK. Yeah, if you look at, right, uh, the last three white papers, derive insights from the modern data, building modern data stream analytics, big data analytics. <laughs> we both wrote these white papers. It is our work. Okay, anybody has any questions, uh, definitely uh, I have, uh, we have our LinkedIn profile. You can always reach out um, and we are happy to help. But I would request everyone to go to the app and then please provide the feedback. If you are happy with uh, our session, please uh, fill the feedback. If, we, if you are looking for improvement, please do mention because we both wanted to produce as much as content possible for the customer. Uh, because we are trying to fill the gap where customers are looking for what is the architectural design choices, right? We talked about like uh, MSK, Kinesis, we talked about EMR and Glue, and then we talked about Athena and Redshift. Also, we talked about uh, basically uh, EMR, Athena, and Redshift, right? When to use for interactive queries, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is our kind of connect information here. Feel free to connect with us in LinkedIn. So more than happy to answer additional questions. So again, there's it's a lot yeah. of services in here, right? So we are just touch upon a few services in here. And uh, if you, you know, the key takeaway for today's session is you are using the right tool for your right needs, right? One size doesn't fit all. So that's the key message you can take. Yeah, away. we purposefully end like two minutes early. Please, everyone, there is an app here. Please go through this uh, app and then provide your uh, uh, feedback here. I would request everyone to fill. That way it will help uh, to conduct these kind of sessions more. And we are planning to conduct uh, uh, these kind of sessions in other events as well. Yeah. And uh, if you are looking for some additional content, uh, there is a button here, uh, um, recommendation. You can always fill here. And if you have any questions, uh, we are both are in LinkedIn. You can send, yeah. uh, actually, you can send us messages. If you want to talk about it a little bit more, we are happy to help. Great. Thank you, everyone.